Well, happy Mother's Day to all the women of influence here at the Grove. Do we not have a lot of amazing women at this church? We do. Um, And the influence that God has given you, you've used to reach many people in your family, um, in our city. Uh, We have a lot of faithful women in this church who love the Lord, and our church is better because of you. At this time, I'd just like to say a a special blessing upon you. If you're sitting next to uh, a special lady, uh, your your wife, your mom, an aunt, a friend, uh, would you put put your hand on them? And uh, as we just commit them uh, to the Lord, uh, make sure you know them before you do that. (laughs) And uh, let, 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 let us pray for these wonderful women that God has given to us. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for giving us all these wonderful women at this church. Uh, For those who have a wonderful wife that they're sitting next to, thank you for them. Thank you for the moms. Thank you for um, the aunts and for all those women who have been faithful to use their influence uh, to make you known and to make our church what it is. God, I know that each woman that's here today um, is in a different season of life, has different emotions, has different feelings, but we know that no matter what, they are all loved by you. And, and, and we pray together as a church that every single woman of influence here today would feel your love and your comfort and would be inspired to continue to use all the gifts and abilities they have in their season to make you known. But Lord, we thank you for them and we ask for your blessing upon their life. We pray this in your name. Amen. I still can't believe everything that women, that, that moms do, uh, that starting with birth, you know, that deserves a candy bar. <laughs> you know what? Grab two. <laughs> Actually, grab one. We have more services. <laughs> uh, their patience, their love, uh, changing diapers, cleaning up, throw up, and not that I don't help with that. I try my best. I have a bad gag reflex, and I'll continue to help <laughs> as much as I can, but their, their, their patience, their love. The insight that God has given them to love their children. Um, I mean, man, God saw it was not good for man to be alone for multiple reasons, <laughs> okay? And uh, just the role of a, of a mom in caring for their children, even in seeing Natalie and how she cares for our kids and points them to Jesus in ways where I'm like, wow, you did that so well. A picture of the family up here, you always ask, that's from Easter. I'm so thankful for her, and I know you're thankful for the women of influence in your guys' life. Uh, she's a blessing. I mean, I think about my, my, my own mom. Um, we have some pictures of my mom. If you don't know her, her name is Janice Bishop. She comes to this church with, uh, I, didn't, I didn't include any pictures of my dad. They're, they're, they're married. And they, go, they, they go here. Uh, but it's not about him. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, I have a brother and a sister, Melinda and David. I'm the middle child. Uh, but I, I can say my dad's the spiritual leader of our family, has always been. But the way that my mother loves the Lord, pursues the Lord, uh, my, my relationship with God has grown deeply because of her. I have many memories coming downstairs and watching uh, her do her devotion, uh, having a Swiss mocha. You remember that? <laughs> she loves it. <laughs> She's funny. Um, I remember her seeing that thing. thinking, wow, my, my mom loves the Lord. Uh, my mom uh, first taught me how to memorize scripture when I was just a young kid, uh, five, six years old. I uh, memorized Psalm 23 in the summertime. Uh, where I remember when she first read, I remember this thing, and I, there's no chance I could memorize that. Uh, but every single morning, we do a different part of it. Uh, where now, um, I taught my son Psalm 23 when we'd walk to school. I don't walk him to school every day. Sometimes Natalie does. But when I did, I say, hey, Psalm 23, here's the next verse. And it took us a year, and he, he, has, it, he has it done. Why? Well, because that's what my mom did, did with me. And uh, those things transfer over. I think a, a great way to celebrate your, your mom, uh, if if you're hanging out with her today, is to tell her the things that you've copied um, in your life because of her. I mean, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, right? So, so let them know, hey, I do this because you did that. Um, I, think, I think that would be a, a great way to honor her uh, today. Um, I, I, I can tell you that I genuinely love my mom. Um, not, not just because she's my mom. Think about this. Do you genuinely love your mom? I I do. Uh, because of her kindness and the way that she loved me. I, I have fun memories of her when we were little kids. She would, whenever she'd read us a book at nighttime, she'd take the book and she'd put it in a pillowcase and she'd wrap it up and then she'd, she'd bring it to us three kids and we have to feel it and touch it and guess what book it, it was. I mean, this is something I do now with our pastoral team, you know, where I... <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it is? <laughs> a study Bible. <laughs> 
I, I have memories of her decorating my room when we turned 10 years old because, you know, that's probably the only time where you go from one digit to another double digit. You know, not many people make it to three, so there's balloons and streamers. My mom is fun and goofy. If you want to know where I get my goofy side from, it's her. Okay. It totally is her. She's creative. She's a great host. Makes phenomenal appetizers. You go to the bishop's house, you have appetizers galore. Um, this is why I tell her I like her to host all the time still because of the appetizers. Uh, I just want her to host. Here's the thing. The kindness of my mother has drawn my heart and my sibling's heart to her, to love her. At the same time, I, I, I do remember her discipline. I do. And not that it was over the top or not that I'm going to exaggerate it. I remember it. It was firm. She spanked. It was respectable. All right. Uh, it was. If we talk back in the car, she had a good reach. Um, <laughs> just remember, how can you do that? I mean, just, <laughs> how did you get my leg? <laughs> she did. Uh, soap in the mouth occasionally. It happened. Bar, liquid soap, laundry detergent, whatever was around. <laughs> Don't report her. That's not, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but here's the point. We respected her and we did not, we did not walk over her. Uh, she had a good, a good balance of, of kindness and love and discipline. And both aspects uh, drew our hearts to love her and honor her authentically. Um, if a parent's just all fun and Disneyland and cool mom, like, dude, your mom's so cool, just cool mom all the time. Well, you know, eventually that, that child is going to take advantage of, of that mom um, or that parent because they're just coming to you to get what you want. Parents, is that what you want? You want your kids just to love you just so you can, they can get what they want and use you? <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, you don't want that. that that's, that's not good. At the same time, if a parent is just strictly disciplined and you're tough on your kids over and over again, they fear you, okay, that may last for a while. But once they grow up, they're not going to be afraid of you. And guess what? They're not going to come to you genuinely. They're not going to love you in that same type of way. So as a parent, it's interesting. I mean, you have, to, you have to balance out kindness and love and discipline. And both of those will, will help your kid genuinely lo- love you, um, appreciate you um, along the way. And my mother did that well. Here's the thing. We, we also see this in regards to our relationship with God. He is our Heavenly Father. He is the perfect parent. He is someone who gives us kindness and he gives us love. He doesn't give us everything that we want. I've asked for many things uh, that I have not received, um, but he gives us what we need. At the same time, he does discipline us as we studied a couple weeks ago and Tom walked through, through, through that um, with us through the book of Hebrews that we see that God shows us love, that God shows us discipline, and he's giving us both aspects. Why? Because because he wants us to genuinely love him, because he wants it to be authentic. God doesn't want to be used by us. He doesn't want us just to come to him and say, well, I, I just want this and this and this, and if you can't give this to me, well, we'll forget you and peace out. I mean, he wants his children to genuinely love him. Think about that for a second. Do you genuinely love God? Why do you come to God? What makes you draw near and approach him every single day? The passage that we're going to be studying today in Hebrews chapter 12, 18 through 29, this is what it's talking about. It's trying to get to the heart of the matter of why we come to God. Do we come to him for the appropriate reasons? Because if you do not come to him for the appropriate reasons, guess what? Your relationship with him is not going to last. But if you come to him appropriately, authentically, with a genuine love, you're going to see your faith grow and grow and grow. Um, Your relationship with God will be stronger, and God will receive more praise uh, uh, along the way. So this is what we're going to be looking at, Hebrews 12, uh, 18 through 29. Think about that. Why do you come to God? Um, This passage is going to help us. Now, I have to tell you, this passage that we're reading is really the summary of Hebrews, We've been spending five months in Hebrews together as a church, and now he's going he's gonna to summarize it. I, I understand there's, there's 13 chapters. Uh, we will spend a full month in chapter 13, but chapter 13 is kind of like the, the P.S. of a letter. Like, hey, I'm, I'm done with everything I want to say. P.S., do this and this and this and this. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 13. It's, it's good stuff there, but from all the deep theology from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, what the, the pastor or the author of Hebrews wanted us to get, it's summarized 
It's summarized in this passage right here. So let's check that out, Hebrews 12. We'll start with verses 18 through 24. And it talks about us coming to the Lord and why we come. Uh, the, the pastor says, you have, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying to Moses, uh, well, it was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant into the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And we'll stop right there. Now, we can see in, in, coming, in coming to God, there's, there's a comparison uh, right off the get-go of how we come to God. You either come uh, to the mountain of fear or you come to the mountain of joy. Um, in, in this passage right here, remember I just asked you, why do you come to God? The author's starting to talk into this. He starts off by saying to the people that he's talking to, you have not come to the mountain of fear. That's the start. Now, this mountain of fear that he's describing in verses 18 through 21, it's Mount Sinai. Uh, Mount Sinai is the mountain that we see in Scripture where Moses cl climbs up and he receives the Ten, the Ten Commandments. And we see this in the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12, 18 through 21. And what the author is doing is he's recounting the Israelites' experience of them coming to God and meeting God in Exodus chapter 19, verses 12 through 25. And, and we're getting a visual of this, that when, when the people came to meet with God, it, it was as if this mountain was on fire. Uh, it was cloudy. It, it, was, it, was, it was dark. It was darkness. Um, there, there was a lot going on. And when the people uh, told, when they heard the trumpet blast, they were supposed to come and be in his presence. The Lord was going to meet him there. And Moses gives them very strict instructions on what they are supposed to do to prepare themselves to meet with uh, the Lord. Uh, one of the very first things that's been told, that he told them is, do not touch the mountain. Do not. You're going to meet God at the mountain. Do not touch the mountain. If you touch the mountain, you're going to die. And you'll die, die through either being stoned or shot with arrows. I don't know if they got to choose or what, but that, that was the punishment. And so not only will, will you be killed if you touch this mountain, but even your animals. Your animals must not touch the mountain. So go, so go home and tra train your cats and dogs to stay or else they're goners. And then everyone was told this. Say, so go, go home and bathe. Go home and wash your clothes. All, all, all the married couples do, do not even have sexual relations with each other leading up to this time that me, we meet with God. Why? Because you're about to meet the all holy, mighty, powerful God. And you need to be prepared for this. Our God is holy. Our God is set apart. And we see this at the whole mountain. Mount Sinai was set apart. Why? Because God's presence was there, his awesome, holy presence. And the people were terrified. I mean, Moses was terrified. He trembled at the presence of God. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, after they're given the Ten Commandments, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Don't be afraid, God's just come to make you afraid <laughs> so that you will not sin, but that you will obey him. And you see this with the people. The people could not even hear his voice. Where they're telling him, stop, stop speaking. You are just too great and powerful for me. And, 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 and we see that throughout the Old Testament where maybe a prophet is brought before the glory of the Lord and it's too much for them to bear and they're, they're, li they're lying on, on the ground on their face and, and an angel has to come up and touch them or something. Why? Because God's too holy for us. In, in, in the nature of, of humanity and who we are, you cannot approach God. And, and we see that here. In the Old Testament, God's presence is not accessible the people had to stay at a distance. They had to make themselves as clean as possible and do what he says, otherwise you will die. And that's point number one in your notes. The Old Testament, people came to God in fear. 
it, they, they came to the mountain of fear, Mount, Mount Sinai. And as this pastor in Hebrews is talking to his people, he said, look, that was the old covenant. You, you have not come to the mountain of fear. But from what we've been talking about this whole time in the book of Hebrews, we're, we're in a time of a new covenant. You've, you've come to the mountain of joy. And that's what we see in verses 22 through 24. And there's a lot there in 22 through 24. What you're seeing is really the whole summary of Hebrews in a matter of just a couple verses. Look at it again. This is what what he says in 22 through 24. But you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. And notice this, the amount of times that the author says that you have come. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Once again, you've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, that this is who you have come to. And you can see now that the author is describing the new covenant. He's describing the new order of how we come to God. You have not come to the mountain of fear. You've come to the mountain of joy. You have come to Mount Zion. Now, what is Zion? What is Mount Zion? Now, historically, Zion is, is Jerusalem. I mean, David, David founded, David conquered Zion. That's, that's the city that um, Jerusalem is on. It's, it's on. it's the holy mountain of God. If you've ever been there, I mean, it's, it's on, a, on a mountain. It's where, it's where God chose to dwell with his people. Now, the author's saying that, hey, it's not that they've come to literally the place of Jerusalem. He's saying that you've come to the, the heavenly Zion. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to the heavenly city um, to God himself, where now God dwells in heaven. The author says, and he paints this picture, that you've come to a God who's being worshipped by thousands and thousands of angels joyfully. I mean, those are fun things to think about in your mind, that God is being worshipped by thousands and thousands of angels continually, and we've come to that God, and we join in with the worship. He says that we've come to the church of the firstborn, and that's very similar language when, when it talked about Jesus being that of the firstborn, although in this passage, um, it's not referring to Jesus because it's plural in the original Greek, but to his followers who are the firstborn and we share in the inheritance of Christ. Uh, we are considered the firstborn of Christ, which is awesome. We are his children. We share in his inheritance. The passage says that you come to the, you come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That we come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That sounds very odd and mystical, but really that kind of comes back to even Hebrews chapter 12 um, of the saints of the Old Testament who, who did what God called them to do, and now they are in heaven being perfected by, or they are perfect um, in the eyes of God. And the reason why it's called spirits is because when we die, our spirit goes to heaven, our body remains in the ground, we wait for the second coming um, of Christ for our bodies to be resurrected, but right now their spirits are in heaven. So we come with the spirits of those who live faithful lives, who have been made perfect, we're, we're in that presence as well, worshiping, worshiping God. And then really the summary of it all is that we come to Jesus, the mediator of our faith, of the new covenant, through the sprinkling of his blood, whose blood speaks a better word than that of Abel. Now, if you remember Cain and Abel, Cain killed his brother Abel. It's Adam and Eve's son. And, and God comes to Cain and, and says, Cain, where's your brother? His, his blood um, screams out from the ground um, in Genesis, and it's, 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 it cries out for, for justice, it cries out for retribution, and yet here it's talking about the blood of Jesus, it cries out something so much, so much better. It cries out for forgiveness, it cries out for repentance. Now, I, I just briefly went through these four verses, and there is so much here, and if it's your first time here, I'd be wondering what the heck is all of this stuff talking about? Um, and it would take me about five months to go through it because that's the amount of time that we've spent in Hebrews. But the whole idea of what we're seeing is that you have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament in the Bible, you have the Old Covenant that people used to come and fear. And now all of a sudden through Jesus Christ, who is the mediator between us and God, we cannot come to God on our own through our sin, but through his blood, we can now come to him in joy. And we can come to him freely 
And we can come to him and worship him and not be afraid, but instead be thankful for what Jesus Christ has done for each and every single one of us. That's what he's summarizing right here. Helping the people understand the difference between the two. Point number two on your notes, the new covenant says, come to God with joy, come to the mountain of joy, which is why he keeps telling us, you have not come to the mountain of fear, but you've come to the mountain of joy. You've come to Mount Zion. Now, after he does this, he says, and and this is the interesting part of the text, we're not supposed to be drawn to God just because we're afraid of God. We're supposed to be drawn to him because of his love and because of his kindness. But at the same time, look at this harsh warning in Hebrews 12, 25 through 27. After talking about us coming to this mountain of joy, the author then says this, see to it, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At the same time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain." So like, like I said, very interesting passage here, just following the fact that we don't come to God in fear, we come to him in joy, but then it talks about if you do not come to him in joy, well, guess what? You will not escape him. Well, that sounds a little scary. It does, in my opinion. And these talks about how the Israelites, they didn't listen to God when all the prophets came to this earth, and the, and the people of Israel did not escape God. What happens? I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, you see it. They die because of famine, they die because of drought, they die because of disease, they die because of exile. They did not escape God. Why? Because they did not listen to him. Did not listen to him. And now we're at a point now where it's saying, hey, come to God. He's loving, he's kind, he's kind. He died on the cross for your sins. May that draw you to him. That's what needs to draw you to him. But realize, if you refuse him, the God of love, you will not escape the God of wrath. And maybe that will make you think about his love, which is supposed to draw you in the first place. It's interesting, isn't it? So now we're in this conflict of, okay, well, what draws me to God? Is it his fear or is it his love? And the answer is both. I would say love first. And the fear keeps us coming to him in his love along the way. John Piper says this, fear may not awaken faith and love directly, but it may so shake us from our love affair with things that we can look into the eyes of the one who can. So that's, I think this is what I, this is what I wrestle with. I find myself in this tension as a follower of Jesus who's saved by grace, but at the same time worship a holy, powerful God who sends people to hell, and that's a reality. And he's going to judge the world. He's going to shake up heaven and earth, and only the faithful will remain standing. And in that, I think, well, God, I want to be, I want to be the one remain standing. I believe in your grace. I believe in your power, and I'm right, I'm right here in the middle. So how, how, do we, how do we come to God appropriately and authentically to a God of love and a God of, of power and, and wrath? Um, Psalm 147.10 says this, his delight is in the strength of the horse, excuse me, his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Are you supposed to be afraid of God? I would, I, I, I would, say, I would say yes, in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways, yes, because he's so powerful and and you don't want to fall into the hands of an angry God. I mean, that's what we've been talking about in, in Hebrews. We, we see that. But he's also gentle and kind. I mean, you see C.S. Lewis wrestle with this in a lot, in, in a lot of, our, our, of his writings, where even in, in regards to them talking about Aslan, they're like, is Aslan safe? No, Aslan's not safe, but he's good. Remember that? And another line in, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where it talks about how... how Aslan, the lion who represents God, he is not tame. He's not tame. So we're balancing our thoughts of God along the way. John Piper writes about this in his book, The Pleasures of God. If you're looking for a good solid book to read, a summary, this would be a good one. Um, And he's trying to help us to understand coming to a God 
who we have a living hope, and also a God that we fear. He says in this book, and I'm gonna read a decent sized quote, it says, does it strike you as strange that we should be encouraged to fear and hope at the same time in the same person? Yes, I'm gonna say yes. Do you hope in the one you fear and fear the one you hope in? It's usually the other way around. If we fear a person, we hope that someone else will come and help us. But here we're supposed to fear the one we hope in and hope in the one we fear. What does that mean? Suppose you were exploring an unknown glacier in the north of Greenland in the dead of winter, just as you reach a sheer cliff with a spectacular view of miles and miles of jagged ice and mountains of snow, a terrible storm breaks in. The wind is so strong that the fear rises in your heart that it might blow you off the cliff. But in the midst of the storm, you discover a cleft in the ice where you can hide. Here you feel secure. But even though secure, the awesome might of the storm rages on and you watch it with a kind of trembling pleasure as it surges out across the distant glaciers. At first, there was the fear that this terrible storm and awesome terrain might claim your life, but then you found a refuge and gained the hope that you would be safe. But not everything in the feeling called fear vanished from your heart, only the life-threatening part. There remained the trembling, the awe, the wonder, the feeling that you would never want to tangle with such a storm or be the adversary of such a power. The fear of God is what is left of the storm when you have a safe place to watch right in the middle of it. And in that place of refuge, we say, this is amazing. This is terrible. This is incredible power. Oh, the thrill of being here in the center of the awful power of God, yet protected by God himself. Oh, what a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God without hope, without a savior. I think it's very well written. I mean, so the hope that is found in Jesus, it motivates us to come to him. My goodness, that he would save us from hell, that he would save us, that he would save you. I mean, that, that, that should create so much awe and wonder in our hearts over and over again. But then there's also this fear that we should have of God, that he is almighty God who will judge the world, who will judge the nations, who will judge the earth, who will judge the heavens, and he's gonna shake things up. He's gonna shake things up, why? Because he's gonna see who truly worships him. And the thing that should make us all pay attention is the fact that the author is talking to the church. I mean, he's, he's talking to his congregation of saying, hey, do you come to God for the right reasons? I mean, have, have you come to him? Do you understand who Jesus is? Have you given your life to the Lord? Do you fear God? Because once again, in this passage, I mean, all throughout the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is meant to keep us from falling away. That, that's, what this, this, that's what this whole thing has been about. Where right now, what the author wants us to do, he wants us to hold on um, to grace and he wants us to hold on to fear. That's point number three on your notes today. We, we've talked about the old covenant. We've talked about the new covenant. And now we're talking about today in our life and what he's telling the people. He's saying, look, you have not come in fear. You, ha you have come to the mountain of joy, but you have to hold on to both to remain steady in your relationship with God and to endure this life, this sinful life that we all are in. So we receive his grace and we remember his power along the way. Along the way. You know, if I were to ask you to, to summarize the book of Hebrews in one sentence or two sentences after hearing our passage, after hearing the sermons for five months, what would you say the book of Hebrews is about? What is it about? I, I did my best. This is what I would say. I, I'd say for me, in one or two sentences, the book is don't fall away from the living God. Don't. Understand how great Jesus is and continue to come to him faithfully in all things. That that's the idea for the church. Do not fall away from him. Even in getting together, you know, in Hebrews chapter 10, do not get in the habit of not meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but spur one another on so that we together as a church will keep going, that we will endure, that we will endure the discipline, that we will endure every aspect of this sinful life and that we will remember who Jesus is, the mediator of our faith between us and God, and that we would pursue him in all things, that this is what God desires for each and every single one of us, and that we would stand strong to the end. Where many, many of us, we, we're not standing strong. 
Many of us, we've, fall, we've fallen down. We've fallen away from the Lord. We've been shook, shaken up, shook up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, one of those things. Something shakes us up, and then something ends up leaving. And the thing that leaves is our worship to God. God wants his children to worship him. God wants his children to come to him with an authentic heart of saying, God, you are so, so good. And then something happens in our life, it shakes us, it, rattle, it rattles our faith, and then, and then we, stop, we stop doing that. So the authors remind them, okay, are you holding on to the right pillars of your faith, remembering who God is, to keep you going along the way? I mean, don't you want your faith to be genuine? I, I gotta tell you, I want my faith to be genuine. I mean, as a pastor, I'm, I, I'm fearful for myself that I would turn out to be some type of Pharisee where it just becomes a job. Uh, I'm known as the guy who believes in God and works at a church, and now it's just a part of the reputation. What an awful place to find so yourself in. Don't want that. I, I, w- I want to love the Lord. I want God to look at me and be like, that man loves me. He loves me. What about you? Do you want that? I mean, even in regards to me reading Daniel, I mean, Tom and I have been going through, through Daniel. That's the thing. Mike, Michael, the angel, comes to him and says, you are greatly loved by God. Why? Because Daniel just feared the Lord, honored the Lord in all things over and over again. And God took notice of him. And then God used him in the midst of that too. So what do you hold on to? Why, why do you come to God? Think about it. Why do you come to him? Maybe it's just because you want something from him. You come to him like, I really want this. I need the business to get better. I need it. I need, I need it. I, I need the marriage to work out. I need it. I need all these things. And it's not that it's bad to come to God for things. I mean, we should come to him, but that shouldn't just be the, the, the main reason why we come to him. It should be something more. We should hold on to something firmer because if he doesn't give you what you want, then what? Then what are you going to hold on to? If you, if you just hold on to God because of the way it makes you look, you're in danger. If you just hold on to God because you're afraid of going to hell, it's not a strong enough grip. The way we endure in this life and in our relationship with God is through holding on to grace and holding on to his power and having a reverence for it. And then with that, the response is we worship him. In Hebrews 12, 28 through 29, the last, last couple of verses of this passage, and I think the best ones, it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, with fear and, am- and amazement at what God has done for us. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You know, there's going to come a time where the kingdom of God will not be shaken anymore. What a wonderful time that will be. But right now we live in a sinful world where our circumstances shake up people's lives and they fall away from worshiping God and God does not want us to be shaken. He wants us to hold on to him and follow him and to bring him acceptable worship that happens when we worship him with reverence and awe. And that's point number four on our notes. Point four is the response. The unshaken will worship God with reverence and awe. The ones who are left standing will be those who worship God with reverence and awe. So what does, what does this look like? I mean, for us, what does it look like today? I think for us today, in our minds, we come before the Lord and we say every single day we preach the gospel to ourselves and say, God, I'm amazed by you that you would die for me. I'm amazed by you that in the midst of my sin, you pursue after me over and over again. I'm amazed by your love. I'm amazed by your patience. And we get ourselves to the point where we're just like, God, thank you. God, thank you for what you have done in my life. You are so good. And there's other times too when we're, we know that we're in sin. You know that you're not walking with the Lord, that you have to remind yourself that your ways are ever before him, that you have to remind yourself that God is powerful um, and, that, and that he can remove his hand of favor from, from you and to come before the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. God, I am so sorry for the way that I have been living. Please, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I do not want to cross the all-powerful God of this universe, but I want to walk in the ways that you have for me. 
Which isn't it interesting that Proverbs 9, 9 verse 10 talks about how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That when we fear the Lord, we're going to know how to act. We see this in Proverbs 16, 6. It says, Though the, through the love and faithfulness sin is atoned for, through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. What a great verse to summarize everything that, that we've just talked about. That through the love and faithfulness, our sin is atoned through Jesus Christ. And yet through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided in our lives, which keeps us running after God, enduring to the end, and not falling away so that we can give him the praise and worship that he deserves. And at the same time, just like a loving mother gives kindness and discipline that draws their child's heart to us, so God, in viewing him as his children, we view his love, we view his power, we hold on to both of those things, and we come before him and we say, God Almighty, I worship you. And do anything, do anything you want in my life to keep me faithful. I think it's very interesting that the very last part of this passage, the last, the last verse that we read, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Just so you know, that, you know what that means? It, it, it's, it's talking about God's glory. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever been next to a fire that's just all consuming. I mean, how, how scary it is. This is like a, this is supposed to be a scary end to the verse of just thinking about the fact that God's glory is all consuming and that those who, who, will, who do not choose to follow him and listen to him will be consumed by, by his wrath. And the reason why I think it, it ends this way is so that, that once again increases our level of worship to him of saying, wow, God, in the midst of who you are and how much you hate sin, you love me so much that you would save me from that. God, you are good. God, you are good. And for those of you who are not walking with the Lord today, for those of you who maybe your mom invited you to come to church today, and maybe you say that you believe in Jesus, but you, you really are not following him. There comes a point in your life where you realize, okay, there's more to this life than just work and school and everything else, but there's a God who created this world who loves you, who's pursuing you, who's coming after you, and desires a relationship with you. And I, I would suggest set your eyes on him. Believe in him. Give your life to him. Because here's the thing. If you don't, you will not escape him. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Come to him, experience his love, and understand what it truly looks like to have a relationship with God and being in his presence through his son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that atones for our sins. If you would like to give your life to the Lord today and to become his child, you simply call upon his name and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Um, I call upon your name. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Come into my heart, um, and I want to be your child. And if you do this, you believe this, the Bible says that you will be saved you have questions about that, well, people up front after service to talk about that. But here's the thing. At this time now, look at I'm done with my sermon. We still, we're going to have plenty of time. We're going to sing three songs together uh, right now. And in this time, worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Do not leave early. I promise you, the worship's going to be awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank him for his grace. Re remind yourself of his power and get to a point of saying, God, change me. Change me to worship you in a way that would be pleasing to you in all things. For our first song, our ushers can come forward as we give an offering to the Lord, our, an act of praise to him. Um, God gives us good gifts, and in faith we give back to him for the good of the church. So let me pray over this offering and pray over our time of worship that the Lord would minister to our hearts and even create in us a, a pure heart, O oh God, during these times. Father, we come before you. We come before you through your son, Jesus. We come before you because of his love. And at the same time, Lord, we do come before you in fear, in a good sense of fear, and the fact that you're the, you have so much power and we want to honor you. Father God, may we honor you at this time as we lift our voices and sing loud um, to such a good Father. You're so good, Lord. Uh, we, we come before you with um, our gifts, our offerings. We ask that you bless it, but we come before you with just our lives. And I pray for every person in this room. I pray for myself included. Lord God, please, I beg you that you would put in us a heart that truly desires to worship you 
just because of how great you are. That no matter what our circumstance is, that we would worship you and praise you um, and give you a worship that is acceptable in your eyes. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.